our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. This sums up everything we've been talking about. Okay, so tribulation produces perseverance, which is the same word used, used in Romans 8.25, bearing up under difficult circumstances. Produce is used in agriculture in the making of materials. It means to bear down to the ground, to work at, and to make. So we know that part of a seed becoming a plant is the pressure of the soil, right? So that pressure breaks open along with good watering and things like that to become a plant that, begin to, that begins to work its way out. So this is saying that tribulations or suffering for the gospel produces three products or fruit. Perseverance, character, and hope, or endurance, character, and hope. So it's the pressures on us that do these things. And so then the word character. So this is interesting. You know, the, the very first lesson of the Identity Bible Study was what? That when the Father looks inside us, He doesn't look in a judging or condemning way, but He looks inside of us, and with delight He discovers the same character of Jesus Christ on the inside of us, right? That's what He sees. So the word character is to try to learn the genuine, genuineness of something by examination and testing, often through actual use. It's used in Luke 14, 19. I bought the five pairs of oxen and, and, and am on my way to test them out. In other words, what you say and do in front of others or when times are good, is it real? Uh, in other words, are you genuine in your faith? Okay, so the, the tribulations produce an endurance, and that endurance is testing your character to see if you actually have real character. God knows it. You need to know it. It's kind of like, you know, Adam Schiff believing all his own press. He's a liar. He's lied I don't know how many times. So for us, a lot of times we think we're all that, and then all of a sudden we get in a situation and we're like, oh, okay, maybe I'm not all that. And that produces transformation because we now see ourselves as we really are. Tribulation forces you to put your money where your mouth is. When you see that you truly love God more than man or getting out of a difficult circumstance, your expectation increases and our hope in God will never shame us. He is faithful to all that He promises. Now let's read it in the Passion because it gives us a better understanding. But that's not all. Even in times of trouble, we have a joyful confidence knowing that our pressures will develop in us patient endurance. And patient endurance will refine our character. And proven character leads us back to hope. And this hope is not a disappointing fantasy because we can now, here it is, experience the endless love of God cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. So that's, when you're in the midst of trial, it is like a faucet is turned all the way on of you feeling and experiencing His love on the inside of you. I'm sure y'all can recollect that when you've been through difficult times. You feel that love. It's like it floods you, it cocoons you, it's everywhere you go. And so when you're going through those difficult things, He turns that on so that you can experience it and get through your trial successfully. I'll use your sowing, your seed and your sowing. There's a few seeds that when you go to plant them, they tell you to take a little knife and make a nick in it mm. because it's able to penetrate mm -hmm. and soften. Interesting. Either. That's good. Okay. So he's closer than a friend. That's what this means. The breaking inside of us, the piercing, allows entrance for us to experience His love unlike any other time. Okay? Now, uh, Hebrews 6, 18 through 20, the Passion says, So it is impossible for God to lie, for we know that His promise and His vow will never change. So we have to run into His heart and hide ourselves in His faithfulness, and this is where we find His strength and comfort. For He empowers us to seize what has already been established ahead of time, an unshakable hope. We have this certain hope like a strong, unbreakable anchor holding our souls to God Himself. So when you're going through a rough time, I want you to picture Him taking you into His arms and holding you close. That's what He's doing when you're having a rough time. 
our anchor of hope is fastened to the mercy seat which sits in the heavenly realm beyond the sacred threshold and where Jesus our forerunner has gone in before us he is now and forever our, our royal priest like Melchizedek now listen to the notes of him being a forerunner it means a trailblazer Jesus has blazed a trail for us to enter into the sacred chamber and seizes and sees the hope that has been fulfilled in his eyes already to have a company of king priests who will dwell with him in the holiest of holies and minister from there out to the nations of the earth. The clear implication is that he takes us in to share his throne and his ministry as a royal uh, priest. But our hope takes us into that sacred place where we can be loved on by God. So Jesus is already in heaven having passed through the sacred threshold, which literally means beyond the faces of the door. And establish a kingdom not built with man's hands that will consume all other kingdoms, the kingdom of king priests. Because he was resurrected, so will we be. And our hope in the resurrection anchors us to the mercy seat, who is Jesus. We are connected and experience him through the Holy Spirit as he is in heaven. Paul said we are seated in heavenly places. And in him are all, all promises are yes and amen. Amen. When your hope is anchored in him, it's impossible for the promises to fail. So I'm going to read these scriptures quickly. 2 Corinthians 3, 11 through 12 says, For what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have this hope, such hope, we use great boldness of speech. If the ministry of Moses was glorious to the point that he had to cover his face with a veil because it glowed with the glory, we are assured that the ministry of Jesus is even more glorious, and so we can use great boldness of speech. 2 Corinthians 3, 11 through 12 in the Passion says, The fading ministry came with a portion of glory, but now we em embrace the unfading ministry of a permanent impartation of glory. So then, with this amazing hope living in us, we step out in freedom and boldness to speak truth. 1 John 3, 2 through 3, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has his hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. You don't purify yourself by law. It is you know that when he returns, we will see him as he is. Therefore, we want to be more like him every single day. See, because of hope. 1 John 3, 3 in the Passion says, And all who focus their hope on Him will always be purifying themselves just as He is pure. The true, and this is important, hope in God provokes deeper sanctification. Okay? Now, how to process hope deferred. This is very important because it's very real. So let's finish with that. In Proverbs 13, 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick but when the desire comes it is a tree of life the word hope here is t-o-h-e-l-e-t -E -E it is expectation a positive future prospect expectation and thinking about uh, future events here we have a person looking forward and expecting positive future prospects and events like when we looked forward into moving into our new home mike's new job my new business etc so you get excited and you can't wait, okay? And then, right at the moment, when you're about to enter into the reality of the expectation, it's pulled back. And the idea is like you have a bow and arrow. And the arrow's pulled back, and pulled back, and pulled back, and pulled back. And you're just waiting, thinking that eventually it'll be released, and it's not. Has anybody ever been there, okay? So that's, that's the idea. There's no letting the arrow loose to hit its target. So it's a feeling of being suspended in mid-air, mid-sentence, holding your breath, just waiting. Uh, no ending to a great story. Things left unfinished and left off. That makes a heart sick. The word makes, which I thought was interesting, means to cause illness. And a uh, heart is the organ of the body, but it's also the source of life of the inner person in various aspects with a focus on feelings, thoughts, volition, and other areas of the inner life. It's a loss of courage, ruin of the heart, state of hopelessness, lacking confidence in future situations. 
It's anxiety, worry, and depression that settles in your mind, will, and emotions. Okay? So you, and then, here's what's interesting. When you continue to read the definitions for heart, there's a shift. Just like mercy from last, or a couple of weeks ago, our infamous, infamous, you know, loyal love sermon. Uh, as you read on, this word for heart goes into being stubborn, internally corrupted, and then morally deviant behavior. In other words, your disappointment can turn into a backslidden state. Isn't that interesting? So the Passion says, when hope's dream seems to drag on and on, the delay can be very depressing. So how do you navigate? How do you navigate delayed expectation or fulfillment of promises? Well, it was in a couple of verses we already read. So let's revisit and finish up. Romans 5, 3 through 5. But that's not all. Even in times, this is in the Passion, of trouble, we have a joyful confidence Knowing that our pressures will develop in us patient endurance, and patient endurance will refine our character, and proven character leads us back to hope. And this hope is not a disappointing fantasy because we can now experience the endless love of God cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. In other words, we allow patience to continue to have its perfect work in us while we cocoon ourselves in the experience of the endless love of God cascading in our hearts. Don't try to make things happen. When you're in delayed or deferred hope, just find yourself a corner and let Him love on you. Don't ask Him a bunch of questions and stuff. Just enter into the mystery of trust. That's all you got to do. Easier said than done. We choose to stay in the experiential love of God. We trust Him and we listen for anything He might reveal that's causing a delay. Even if it appears he's silent, we still rest in that love. The second one is one we already read, Hebrews 6, 18 through 20. So it is impossible for God to lie, for we know that his promise and his vow will never change. Now we have to run into his heart and hide ourselves in his faithfulness. you got to meditate on his faithful. That is very important. This, meditating on His faithfulness in His heart, is where we find strength and comfort, for He empowers us to seize what has already been established ahead of time, an unshakable hope. We have this certain hope like a strong, unbreakable anchor holding our souls to God Himself. Our anchor of hope is fastened to the mercy seat which sits in the heavenly realm. So, we, when we hide ourselves in His faithful, faithfulness, we allow our soul to go into how He's faithful, then what happens is we find His strength, His comfort. We're not just doing wrinkle face trying to hold on. We're inside there. You meditate on how He's been so good. I remember the first financial trial we had, my friend Cindy recommended I write a blessing list. Yeah. There were monuments of all the goodness of God, and I did, front and back. Wrote it. I was amazed. I, I had no idea how much he had done for us. I would suggest doing it even when you're not going through anything bad. It's not fu uh, the fulfillment. Uh, oh, wait. Hang on. It's here that he empowers us to seize what are, has already been established. It's not the fulfillment for then you don't need hope. It's in him that we draw his strength and comfort. You're not pulling at the bootstraps and carrying on in your own strength. You're tapping into his strength. Then you draw on his hope. A hope that goes way beyond our own. His hope is certain. It acts as a strong, unbreakable anchor holding our souls, our mind, will, and emotions to Him. He's embracing you. I want you to get that picture. He is embracing you. He's saying, come up, up, up here and let me hold you for a little while. That, that's what He's doing. Can you just imagine how His robe must feel? Do you know what I mean? Like if you have it smells like... Mm -hmm. I'm going to need to borrow someone's passion for a, a second when we get done. Okay, Jesus did uh, this for us in the midst of incredible pressure, so we just follow him in his footsteps. I know from past experience, the more I trust him and experience his presence and love, the easier it is to maintain hope. If I'm not actively seeking him and I'm just going through the, the motions, I can struggle during the waiting. But one thing I have learned is wrestling and struggling to make things happen or get out of a difficult time as fast as possible actually delays the ending. It's also important to know when the delay is designed and when it's the enemy. 
So in the passion of that verse of hope def deferred, but when at last your dream comes true, life's sweetness will satisfy your soul. Let me just say this. It is not a guarantee that uh, delayed hope causes sickness. That's your choice. Okay, he's not saying it's a commandment. You have a choice in the matter. So the New King James uses the King James uses the word desire. It's a state of having a wish or want for something for the pleasure it brings. It's the desire of good quality items. A tree continually bears fruit, brings fruit, shade, and other benefits that add to life. Life here is to have a prosperous, bountiful, blessed, favorable circumstances in life contrasted with a cursed, unfavorable life. God wants you to have a prosperous, abundant life. Marriage, business, soul, uh, time with Him, just everything that is good, safety, all that you can think of that makes up a good life, He purchased that and He wants you to have it because that's the opposite of a cursed life, okay? So to desire good things is not bad. I read something, oh, it was in that book of mysteries and he's talking about you know that we need to sow without an expectation of return I'm like that's stupid what I'm never going to sow without an expectation of return mm -hmm. because it's against the uh, Genesis 9 where he says as long as the seasons last there will be sowing and there will be reaping and when you sow you reap but uh, I might have posted it on uh, Facebook but listen to this out of Proverbs because it reminds me of going into his heart and hiding So this is in Proverbs 18.10, and it goes right along with what we learned today. The character of God is a tower of strength. For the lovers of God delight to run into His heart and be exalted on high. So the word tower of strength, the Hebrew word migdal, translated as tower of strength, is a homonym that can also be translated bed of flowers. So I started thinking when um, uh, I used to go out in our backyard on uh, 10th Street and I would lay in the hammock and I'd just be out in my garden, you know, watching the birds, watching the butterflies, you know, the blue jays, all that stuff. But just picture just being surrounded by flowers. You know, you're just laying there. The smells, the peace, the calm, the presence. And that's what it is. So it is you run into the character of God. You're running into a peaceful place. Have you ever been somewhere, or even with headphones on, where all sound and distraction is gone? That's what it is. And uh, just a lot of peace. So we delight to run into His heart. And He says He'll exalt us. Why? Because He is exalted. So when you run into Him, you're also exalted or lifted above your circumstances. Isn't that neat? Not necessarily, you know, Him putting you in positions of authority, which that I'm sure could include. So handling your trials um, correctly is really, really important. So trust, letting Him love on you, all of those things. Um, watching for any subtle blame of Him is really important because uh, you know, that was the tactic the enemy used with uh, Adam and Eve. So um, anyway, any thoughts or I own kind? Well, talking about hope. Can I borrow someone's pen? Babe. Um, I have a oh. new girl working here. I need to do that. Non. She's been looking for a car for about a Thank month you know. and a half. So, but, but she's looking at the, the insurance is too expensive. So there were five of us there. We were all Christians. So I said, hey, we're all here. Let's come in agreement since you're having a hard time. And we'll let Jesus, we'll let God find your car. 
I said, no, I'm not thinking it's what you want. It's probably like an SUV, maybe four-wheel drive. It's going to cost you maybe about maybe twelve, thirteen thousand. It's going to have like maybe low mileage, maybe eleven thousand, twenty thousand. And I just started praying and saying stuff. <laughs> she came yesterday, and she says, I need to talk to you. It's okay. <laughs> and I said, what's up? I said, you can talk in front of her. She's a Christian. She said, okay. As I tell her, I said, I can't pray for people in front of people, uh, anybody. So anyway, she says, it came. I said, what came? The car. It's not what I wanted. Okay. But it's what you said. It's like That's SUV. Cheap. That is <laughs> neat. I said, how much? She says, $13,000. I said, what's wrong with it? She says, nothing. That's why I'm going to go check because I'm headed in car come. So whatever. She says, but it came. I said, well, how many words were you? Five questions. I was doing my little lady. Don't know her hair. Takes forever. And she says, oh, there were five of us. And it came. So, anytime I need something, I'll come see you. <laughs> I said, no. You're going to go talk to God. Yeah. God's the one who did it. We just agreed. And you yeah. prophetically gave a word of knowledge. Right. Yeah. And so, she had to see the goodness of Father. That, that's And it's good to redirect it. You know, like, no, you need to go pray. You, you can do this, you know? You can do it. Yeah. Your uh, niece that was in the motorcycle accident was at Tony's funeral, huh? Uh -huh Liz. I was shocked. She looks good. At how good mm -hmm. she looked. It's supposed to do that. I noticed a little eyes. bit of scarring yeah. right here, uh -huh. but I was shocked at how She's good she looked. She's got no scar on her head. That's what shocked me that she's got no scars up here. I mean, the thing was crack opening three places. Yeah. And there's... And usually you will, and you'll lose your hair there. Yeah. And you won't grow. Yeah. yeah. And she's got hair, and I thought... She's beautiful. Of course it's scar. She says, what's going on? I said, on your head. She says, I don't have any. It's not got good. Maybe I should have her lay hands on me. I got a scar from a <laughs> surgery a long time ago. I wish I didn't have <laughs> That is awesome. Yeah, yeah, she looked amazing. Well, let's uh, uh, pray over our tithe and offering. And Father, we thank you so much for the Word of God. We thank you that you're such a good daddy and that we have a high priest that understands everything that we walk through and go through. He does not condemn us. He doesn't push us away. He doesn't dismiss anything. He doesn't um, make us feel like we're weak or anything like that. Instead, you draw us into yourself. And so, Father, we ask that you allow us. I can think of, like, you know, babies when they're upset and you try to cuddle on them and they just stiffen up and they pull away because they're so caught up in what is making them upset. And sometimes we do that too. We get so caught up and so focused on what is wrong that when you're trying to draw us into yourself, into your character as a strong t uh, tower, we stiffen. Or maybe we don't know how to just allow you to take care of us because we've always taken care of ourselves. Maybe we've never experienced that. And so, Father, I pray that you help us develop into apostles of hope. That any time we're in the midst of a trial or a tribulation or something difficult, that we learn to let go, to lay aside any human reasoning and ways we want to fix things and maybe if we do this or try this and instead we just run over to you and allow you to embrace us in the love of God that continually is cascading into our hearts. Father, we want to experience you in a whole new way this year. So we ask that you help us do that. And Father, we pray right now for those in our uh, families and our friends that maybe they're going through a rough time and maybe they've had deferred hope. Maybe they're struggling with depression or anxiety or if anybody is in this room. Father, we ask that you develop in them a deeper level of trust in your character and who you are as a person. And we also bind and break off a spirit of delay in case it is demonic, Father. And we also break off depression and heart, heart sickness. Father, we also break off a mindset that exalts itself against you, that you're withholding something good. And Father, we remove the veil from their eyes so that they can see that you are always good and anything good comes from you. And so, Father, we want to pursue you. And as we pursue you, we pursue the promises of God. And as we pursue the promises of God, we are transformed into the very image of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we also want to be people of prayer. 
So we ask that you help us to pray in tongues more and pray in uh, our, our native language more and become people of prayer, making mention of one another as we think about one another. And Father, I thank you for the family that you have created here, that we've allowed each other to open up and become um, impacted by one another. We pray that you continue to grow this, that we continue to celebrate each other. And Father, I pray for my husband and his new job, for extreme, tremendous favor in Jesus' name. And I pray, Father, that who he is as a person of justice and righteousness be made plain and that you exalt him as you see fit. I pray for Darina. Father, there's a, a, a delay, the arrow being pulled back, especially when it comes to employment. And so, Father, whatever it is that you're working in her, I ask that you continue that work. But I also ask, Father, that her hope and expectation for good things become clearer and clearer in their focus. That, Father, the life you originally wrote out for her in her books comes into focus, Father, so that she knows to where, where she's even supposed to be directing her hope. Vision. Vision, Gigi, if you could lay hands on her. Vision, I impart right now to Darina. Vision, in Jesus' name. I decree an end of visionless living from a wounded spirit, a person that people did not pour into expectation, Father. I pray now that you fill into her expectation of her worth, her value, what you've got for her, who she'll be impacting, what she'll be doing for a living, where she'll be... Uh, living, what she'll be driving, uh, uh, what she'll be wearing, just all of those things, Father. I pray that you bring it.